Thank you so much. Now, on behalf of all the people that you have mentioned, now we'd like to move on and would like to read out to a proposal of principle for universal jurisdiction. Now we are opening a time for reflection about these principles for universal jurisdiction. Hello, good afternoon. I would like to thank Fikbar for having invited me here. So that, well, we stand together to continue fighting, to continue with our struggle. Just a few words and that hopefully will represent everyone present here. Truth, justice, and reparation. Universal jurisdiction throughout the last decade has uh, shown that it is a efficacious instrument to find justice from the precursors of international law, such as Francisco de Victoria, Diego Covarrubias, Francisco Suarez, and Hugo Roches. Up until today, the international community has managed to consolidate the idea that there are crimes that, due to their nature and special seriousness, are no longer um, taken care of by a sovereignty state and that start to affect the international community. Therefore, all the states are responsible to prosecute so that the perpetrators do not go unpunished. International criminal law has been widely developed since the build-up of Nuremberg tribunals and Tokyo tribunals that have continued with the creation of ad hoc international criminal uh, courts as well as international ICC. The approval of the Rome Statute that created, that led way to the creation of the International Criminal Court was one of the great milestones because it offered a rational response to the most severe crimes. And it also helps make progress in the fight to protect victims and to fight impunity. However, the response has been, and it is still insufficient, not because of the lack of universality of the statute, but because of the political, temporary, territorial limitations. And therefore, it is essential for this function to be strengthened by the application of or implementation of the principle of universal jurisdiction, as it has been stated under uh, different treaties and conventions in the world. So after the evolution of the last 25 years that international criminal law has seen, international law for human rights as well as humanitarian law require an important reflection about the achievements obtained as well as the failures or lack of agreements between lawmakers and legal experts about an instrument such as universal jurisdiction, which has proven to be essential in the systematization and in the enforcement of international law as well as common law, especially within the framework of crimes that have an impact on those rights, with a view to find a common point that will help us make progress and to continue moving along those lines and then to reduce impunity and to widen the protection of victims. We want all that to become a reality. The Princeton Principles on Universal Jurisdiction did that task in the year 2001. However, 13 years later, after the publishing, we can see that implementation of those principles has suffered a number of innovations and great progress. However, the circumstances and the needs have changed dramatically. The update and the enlargement of those principles is therefore essential. It is just the, the, well, this is the purpose of the people who are here and who have been here working this conference. We also want these principles to serve as a guideline for the implementation of the principle of universal jurisdiction. Of the crimes that are included within this declaration, some of them are there already being prosecuted, and others, such as those referred to in point three of principle number two are defined and they are said to be prosecuted as a hope, as a hope to protect humanity uh, uh, comprehensively. 
as well as to protect society as a whole against the severe economic, financial, and environmental attacks that all of us in society are victims of. Our will to support these principles within the framework of an important reflection with uh, half, well, with 50 legal ex politicians, victims from different countries, and participation of representatives of international courts, people working in the field of human rights. And well, this tells us that these principles, we want these principles to open up a debate and to be adhered and accepted by the various countries and institutions with a view to have a better protection to our citizenship to our citizens thank you so much First principle, the concept of uh, universal jurisdiction determines the obligation to investigate and eventually prosecute in domestic courts that acknowledge it for the benefit of the international community. All those crimes that are identified under the, under principle number two, regardless of where they've been committed, regardless of the nationality of the suspect, nationality of the victims or the existence of any other connection with the state, the enforcing state, through the enforcement of domestic criminal law and international criminal law, as long as the facts have not been pro already prosecuted before another national or international competent court, and if they've been prosecuted, it, due process should have not been respected. Principle number two, universal prosecution crimes. The principle of universal jurisdiction will be enforceable in the following cases. Serious crimes of international law, that is genocide, crimes against humanity, crimes committed in the context of an armed conflict, piracy, slavery, enforced disappearances, torture, extra-legal executions, arbitrary or expedited uh, executions, and other inhumane, such as the use of force that might be a clear violation of the United Nations, serious crimes against uh, nature and environment, and also economic crimes that have a general impact on the fundamental rights of people and the community, such as food fraud, price speculation on staples, on which uh, the survival and health of a large amount of people is dependent, forced labor and labor exploitation of minors without meeting the internationally acknowledged labor rights, unlawful exploitation of natural resources that might have a serious impact on health, life, or peaceful coexistence of people in the natural environment, in the space where the exploitation takes place unlawful diversion of international funds that have been approved in order to relieve humanitarian catastrophes, unlawful trafficking of weapons towards areas or conflict areas or where there is an express ban for exploitation by the UN, the misappropriation of assets from victims of crimes that have been identified under these principles, and irreversible destruction of ecosystems and any others as defined in other conventions or international treaties. Principle number three, extraterritorial enforcement of criminal law states, also in accordance with what's been said forth before, can set within their domestic legislation other provisions to regulate the extraterritorial enforcement of the law for crimes that are part of organized crime, transnational organized crime or criminality, trying to make it prosecution a factor for cooperation and coordination amongst the states according to what's been set forth in international treaties where they are to be found. Principle number four, criminal liability. First of all, any natural or legal person will be held accountable 
in criminal and civil terms of the crimes listed under Principle 2. Specifically, high command in organized power structures as subordinates who won't cite superior order. Second, criminal liability of legal people should be enshrined and, and included into domestic or conventional law for it to be enforced and it will be independent from the identification, prosecution and conviction of natural people that are considered perpetrators. Principle number five. Enforcement of the universal jurisdiction principle when it is not included in domestic legislation. All states must include or a, a transpose to their domestic legislation this principle of universal jurisdiction. Second, courts of law in all states must enforce the universal jurisdiction principle even if it is not present in their domestic legislation. Principle number six, limitation period amnesty pardon. The provisions of the states where the crimes were committed with regard to limitation period amnesty pardon and other measures trying to waive liabilities will not be enforceable in case of international crimes, judiciary powers that enforce universal jurisdiction regarding these international crimes will not be bound to state provisions in terms of limitation period amnesty, pardon and other measures trying to preclude responsibilities. In any case, we need to take into account what's been set forth on under paragraph number two of this very same principle. Principle number seven, international criminal legality. Actions and omissions that are considered a crime as set forth under principle two will be prosecuted in accordance with the universal jurisdiction principle as long as when they were committed, they are criminalized according to international law, even though in domestic criminal laws, both in the state where the crimes were committed and also the enforcing state, were not criminalized as offenses or crimes. Principle number eight. Start a, initiate an investigation when the suspect is present in domestic territory. The state where the suspect is located doesn't matter how they've been a prosecutor, or sorry, a perpetrator or an insider, but if they are suspect to some extent of any of the crimes under principle number two, to any extent, there will be an investigation started and there will be cautionary measures for personal and, uh, and also for the assets of the suspect. As long as he or she is found out, regardless of the existence of a previous request for extradition. Principle number nine, presence of the accused or defendant during investigation. The courts of law will investigate the facts and uh, liabilities of the suspected perpetrators according to universal jurisdiction principle to the point where the adjective laws and states require their physical presence in the proceedings. I don't have my classes with me. Principle number 10, complementarity of the International Criminal Court. 
de la Corte Internacional. Es que de, no veo bien. Aquí. I'm afraid I cannot read that easily. De la Corte. Ay, Dios mío, qué mal veo. Um, de los estados. The states. A través de sus tribunales. Through their domestic y en el ejercicio courts de la and in the enforcement of universal jurisdiction are complementary to the International Criminal Court in the investigation and on prosecution of the crimes that fall under the scope of the Criminal Court. Thank you very much. Principle number 11, conflicts of national jurisdictions. The legal investigation of a FAT can be eventually started at the same time by domestic jurisdictions in two or more states, which by the way are obliged to cooperate to achieve a better resolution of the case. The state that, according to the proaction of principle, proves that it's in a better position to prosecute the facts will have priority over the investigation without having a predefined hierarchy of jurisdictional principles. When assessing the conditions for prosecution, amongst other elements, the potential prosecution, credible prosecution elements will be taken into account for the country where the crimes were committed the place where the alleged perpetrator is located, access to evidential evidences, also protection measures for victims and witnesses, and also independence and impartiality that is the basis and will be the basis of the proceeding. In any case, the court of law, enforcing court of law, will take investigation, personal and asset investigation that are necessary about all the people in question until the conflict is sorted out. And the decisions made will be effective and valid. Number three. We offer the creation of a task force to sort out potential case law or jurisdictional conflict um, disagreements at the United Nations and the decisions need to be binding and adopted within 30 days. Reciprocal legal assistance, first paragraph. Court of law in states will assist each other in any in any proceeding that started according to the universal jurisdiction principle as long as the demanding court of law works in good faith and there is no clear reason to think that the alleged author could be undergoing torture or other abuses or degradations such as um, enforced disappearance of people, would not be sentenced to death, or that would hold a trial in a condition contrary to due process, even if they are guaranteed by the demanding state. In Otherwise, then, when trying to offer legal assistance, the allegation by states of, of the absence of dual incrimination, this will not be a hindrance. According to what we said out on principle number seven, then, the lack of a knowledge of this principle will not prevent from offering legal assistance. Number 13, extradition. States will refuse extradition requests from other state enforced that have jurisdiction, even universal jurisdiction, when they have clear reasons, profound reasons to think that the alleged author will undergo torture and other mean, inhumane or degrading treatments and abuses, such as person, uh, enforced disappearance of, of persons, death sentence, or will not have due process, although even if there are other kinds of safeguards offered by the state but indicate otherwise. If there is a refusal for extradition, we'll have to investigate and prosecute these alleged perpetrators and the principle too. Then, the allegation of the states that they said there is no dual criminality, this will not be hindrance to the extradition. Then, fourthly, the 
lack of recognition of the universal jurisdiction principle by the demanding state will not preclude extradition. Principle number 14, Nevis in Vidin. Courts of law will make sure that no one is prosecuted or punished for a fact that has already been, for which they've been convicted or acquitted with a, a firm resolution or ruling. If they're using this principle, they can only prosecute similar facts that have already been prosecuted unless the process has not been respected in the aforementioned country, especially if it's not been done on an unbiased and independent way, or if the, the, the goal was to waive the uh, defendant's responsibility. Transitional justice. States will exceptionally enforce the universal jurisdiction principle to transitional justice processes if the international standards of justice have not been taken into account and if there's been some kind of misuse trying to wave away the liability of the defendant. Principle 16, independence of legal or uh, authorities or prosecuting authorities. These authorities that are in charge of the investigation need to act independently and in an unbiased way with all the processes that are started according to the principle of universal jurisdiction. The rulings need to be based slow, slowly in legal considerations without any kind of political interferences of any kind. And they will interpret domestic laws according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and all the international treaties and agreements for human rights, financial and economic social rights and cultural rights, as well as humanitarian law and resolutions by the courts of human rights and international justice. Can you hear me? Principle 17. Courts of law and prosecuting office. Uh, states will create these kind of offices for the investigation and prosecution of crimes that are subject to the principle of universal jurisdiction. Principle number 18, victims and witnesses. First, enforcing the principle when enforcing this principle, victims will be those that individually or collectively have suffered damages as a consequence of the commission of crimes described under principle number two, as well as families or dependents that have a direct relationship with them or people who have been in danger because of their help that they've provided, regardless whether the perpetrator has been identified, arrested, prosecuted, or convicted. These courts of law will safeguard the rights of the victims to truth, justice, full reparation, and guarantees of non-repetition in all the decisions and rulings they make according to all international standards. As for asset reparation of victims, there will be no bad secrecy operative. Finally, the interest of the victims will be taken into account before, during, and after the proceedings being decided according to the universal jurisdiction principle. At the same time, they will have access and participate in the process. Number four, states that investigate, prosecute, or cooperate with another state throughout the procedure or proceedings according to the principle of universal jurisdiction will take all necessary measures to guarantee the safety, security, participation, intimacy, Privacy, sorry. And physical and psychological well being of victims and witnesses at all times. Number five, the specific needs of victims will be taken into account, especially if they are vulnerable, in order to guarantee their interest and safety and security to, to avoid all kinds of re victimization. Number 19, interpretation. Nothing of what's been set forth will be interpreted in order to narrow about the enforcement of the universal jurisdiction principle in, a, in accordance with the international law or its further development. And it should on either reduce the right of victims to truth, justice, full reparation, and, and, and uh, guarantees of non repetition. Since I'm the last speaker, uh, let me begin by expressing my own personal appreciation uh, and admiration for the 
splendid job which has been done in preparing this conference. Uh, I just have to remove my horns, but uh, this is an illustration of the gradual awakening of the human conscience. You've listened, and I'm sure it went much too fast for you to really understand the sense of what this is all about. To give universal jurisdiction to courts, criminal courts, in order to enforce important human rights, in order to deter and prevent and penalize atrocious crimes. That is the goal of this meeting and this organization. Of course, the goal is a very noble one, and it will take a long time before it can be fully realized. The temple of the law is built only one stone at a time. Many of the necessary stones already exist in some form, in the form of the various international criminal courts, which have been created in the relatively short time period. Nuremberg laid down a very important principle that the supreme international crime was the crime of aggressive war, because at wartime, all of the other crimes are committed. As a former combat soldier, I can attest to that from my own observation. Rape, pillage, murder, theft, all of these things are committed particularly in wartime where the social controls disappear. So we have begun a system of trying to regulate that after the Nuremberg trials, which were affirmed by the General Assembly of the United Nations, this became the goal of such members of society as preferred law to war. The logo on my website is law, not war. If that could be realized, imagine what the world would look like. We would save billions of dollars every day which are today wasted on munitions and nuclear weapons we cannot possibly use. The money saved would be available to help pay off the costs of education, which the young people face today, to improve the health care facilities for the elder people, etc. So why can't it be done? Uh, I say it can be done. I recognize that it will take time, but look what we have already done during my lifetime. True, I am now in my 95th year, and I've been working at this for as long as I can remember, but let us see the enormous changes which have occurred. Despite the inadequacies which have been pointed out in the rights of women, I remember the days when women had no rights they couldn't own property in the United States with our great constitution. They couldn't vote. They couldn't go to my law school. They wouldn't let them in. What a change in just a simple thing like that. Also the end of colonialism, the end of apartheid usually in many places. All of these things which were firmly entrenched in the mentality of millions of people and became the practice for many years, no longer exists today. So we can see that it's possible to change, but the process of changing the way people think and the way they feel, that cannot be done quickly, no matter what you do. So this meeting is an illustration of what sort of things you do to change people and educate them toward a more humane and peaceful world. It has to be done on every level of society, for the youngest through to the oldest. We have religious leaders here who have been preaching peace as part of their gospel forever, but 
many religions have done that. Thou shalt not kill is fundamental. Uh, so you recognize that you have to have a program, you have to be dedicated, you have to work at it, and you have to anticipate problems and setbacks. The courts which exist today are prototypes. They're beginning. They have the early babes, newly born. And at the beginning, they will all crawl and require support of all kinds. As they grow and are developed, they will take care of the older parents, those of you who have worked for the court, uh, in the future. And it will be the rule of law instead of the law of the jungle, which exists today. So that is my conclusion. Uh, after seeing all of this happening and being part of it, fortunately for me, I've dedicated to this goal all my life. And I am optimistic because I see the progress. I see the problems, but the progress is enormous. It absolutely would have been incredible. If I had said to someone, I did 50 years ago, we want to have an international criminal court, they laughed and said it'll never happen. Well, we live in a world where the impossible is possible. You can take a little thing out of your pocket and look at it, and you can talk to your grandmother in China, if you have a grandmother in China. And uh, these are things which were inconceivable to the human mind. With this little revolution in information, the time will come fairly soon where the rest of the world all has the same type of education and begins to understand that law is better than war. When they understand that, the days of the fear that we now all have, that war may break out with our capacity day, today to kill everybody on Earth, that fear, I hope, will diminish and we can all have a more peaceful and humane society. And that is the goal of this meeting. It's not going to solve all the problems, but it's going to point in the right direction by demonstrating that there is a constituency, a political group there which has to be satisfied and not just brushed aside and ignored as too often has been the case. So my wish to you is good luck, buena suerte amigos, and uh, all the best to you. Thank you. Just a few more words to see you off. Thank you very much for your assistance. I would like to thank the, the, all the people who have been with us the, for these days. I would also like to show my gratitude to Maria, who's made who, quite an effort over these days to lead this event. Thank you all for being here. I think we've met the purpose, we've met the target, that is to highlight what we think is a serious setback against the protection of, vic of victims' rights, all the victims, and protection of all citizens in Spain, and also victims from other nationalities are also impacted, and so it is a general, a global setback, and that is why the, the proposal put forward here with Hernandigo Boto and Pilar Van Den, Pilar Manjón, and many others. These people who have endured the horror of violence and misunderstanding, this needs to be a proposal for the future, a proposal for discussion, maybe for the countries of, of these people who are blind, who are deaf, in the face of essential values. And finally, Sareen Gavadi, thank you very much for your attendance. And Benjamin Ferenc, 
Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for showing to all of us that being optimistic, that having the strength in you, having your life strength, despite so many years, or maybe because of your age, after so many years fighting, it is possible to achieve those targets that we have. In Spain, that's what we want. We want to achieve those targets. No matter if, if aid comes from the Argentinian justice, which would be welcome for the prosecution of uh, crimes under the Franco's regime, or with the cooperation of Spanish law and Spanish judiciary, but we want to make sure that truth through a truth commission to make it possible to have justice, to have reparation. We want those to be the elements to preclude this from happening again. We, want, we don't want any repetition. Thank you very much. Let's hope there is a second conference on the topic on universal jurisdiction. Thank you so very much.